Um, we're going to talk about a few different things. And uh, at the heart of it, what we're going to talk about is how can you use data, how can you use machine learning to understand human behavior? And what does it actually even mean? I am going to partly focus on this side of the room, mostly because most of you are on this side of the room. So don't mind if I ignore you for most of the talk. But I'll come there from time to time, uh, I think. Uh, but you know, uh, at the heart of it, we'll start with something that's uh, most well known and yet not known enough. So life is short, have an affair. Uh, that's what uh, one of the most famous data breaches now of, of all time said. Does anyone know what company that represents? Thank you. Uh, so that was Ashley Madison. They, that's their logo, and that logo has not changed, and it continues to be that way. Uh, and when you really think about it, how, how meaningful that is, in that life is short, have an affair, uh, that motto took the, took the internet by storm until they got breached, because all the people who actually believed in that. But what most of us do not understand when we think of breaches like that is how it happened. How do you go about breaching, which is arguably the most uh, unethical website on the internet, as some of the media called it. The group CEO, Noel Bitterman, he made a claim. He said, I've got their profile right in front of me. It was definitely a person here. What he was referring to was the fact that the breach was not conducted by state activists in China or Russia, as media likes to point out. But in reality, the breach was conducted with the, with the help, if not, if not entirely, uh, assistance of an internal employee. As it turns out, it was most likely a female employee in the company who was really disgruntled and really unhappy, who said, you know what, uh, this is it. And that resulted in the breach. When you really think about it, this whole aspect of, of humans, which is the ability to do bad, goes quite a long way. So when you imagine Sony, when you imagine Ashley Madison, when you imagine even the NSA, and I'm not actually talking about Edward Snowden, if you really think about it. What do they have in common? And it's not that they've been hacked. We all know they've been hacked, and that's normal. But the real thing that's common about them is they've all been hacked through their own employees. And that brings into light something really dire, something really serious, which is that when an organization of the size of Sony, of the relevance and importance of the NSA, can get breached by their own people, what does that actually mean going forward for the world? But how do you even understand uh, what that could be? In the world of security, that's a pretty well-known paradigm that you know, the weakest link is the human. The weakest link is the person sitting behind the desk. Because you know what? We are corruptible. Uh, I like to use a phrase that uh, humans are stupid, because you know, we all are. Uh, on my way here, probably did one or two stupid things, least of which was to take an Uber for a 15-minute ride should have walked. Um, but then again, you know, as we do those stupid things, we make mistakes. As we make those mistakes, uh, we compromise the integrity of the very solutions we protect, the very people we protect. It's very easy to say that if in a given month I make only five mistakes, I'm all right. But if you only make five mistakes, each of those five mistakes is an opportunity for someone else to take advantage of. All you need is one mistake, and we're not robots. So in that humanness of things comes the opportunity for people to take advantage of. At Status Today, what we have done is we created an AI-powered insights platform that actually understands human behavior in the workplace. That's a very big statement. And I'll explain as I go forward what that actually means. Because no, we're not claiming uh, that we've got general AI. We're not claiming that we can predict what you're going to do to some degree. Uh, and we are not claiming that we understand how you feel, not yet. But what we are claiming is that you can understand, if you follow a systemic approach, human behavior within the workplace. We've actually done relatively well. And we've got good foundations. We get called out quite a lot. We've established partnerships to actually scale up what we are trying to do. And none of this is actually relevant when you think about it, because we're not here to understand more about status today. We're here to understand more about our approach to understanding intelligence. But I'm giving you these facts so you remember as I talk going forward that all the claims that I'm about to make and all the data points that I'm about to show, they've been tested in the field live. To give you an example of some of the companies that we've been working with, 
We have been working with the likes of Hiscox, recently starting engaging with Cisco, BAE Systems which is a defense contractor, all the way to law firms and otherwise. So this really spreads far. In the same uh, context of giving you a bit more credibility, uh, why am I the right person to talk about it? Because you know, for all you know, I might be the random dude from the street who just started his own startup. What makes me qualified to actually talk about understanding human behavior? So my name is Ankur Modi. I'm the CEO of Status Today. I founded the company along with my co-founder about a year and a half ago. Um, I have spent a large part of my previous uh, career, I'd say, in Microsoft, where I worked with massive chunks of data that was collected behind the likes of Microsoft Office, the services, uh, have a relatively unique uh, combination whereby I have a machine learning and computer science background along with a psychology uh, add-on, as I like to call it, which I recently did with the help of Oxford. Then I obviously started the company. So all of the introductions aside, uh, all of the name calling aside, let's get to business. People are any organization's most valuable asset. This is a phrase that if you've been in management consulting, if you've been uh, around in the media, it has been thrown around for well over 30 years at this point. But it's never really been understood. What do you mean people are the biggest assets? Why are people the biggest asset to an organization? Surely it's the IP, surely it's the product, surely it's the clients. But people are the biggest assets. But at the same time, what most of us don't understand is people are also the biggest liability in any organization. We ran a survey a while ago, and some of the interesting things we found out is that the average employee spends about 15 hours a month criticizing their boss. <laughs> now, I don't know about you. I'd like to think that in my company it's different. Uh, I don't know. If that's the average, I'd, I'd hope we are below that average, but for all we know, we, we, we might be above that average. Um, the reason for that is, think about it, that's just how people are. You have good days, you have bad days, you have okay days. And those bad days are where we do stupid things. And those good days are where we get opportunistic. So what we did in the world of security is we started putting together the world's largest data set of data breaches. Now what I mean by that is we said we're going to collect information about any breach that has ever happened in our capacity. And we started scouring the likes of SEC, uh, the governance uh, bodies in UK. We looked at the Department of Health and Human Sciences. We looked at breach repository, the privacy rights in the US, uh, ID theft, IBM reports, across the board. The goal was to collect a data set that would represent, arguably, the biggest collection of all breaches ever happened. But not the data, because if we collected the data, we would be attacked the next day. So what that resulted in is, it resulted in data about 10,000 public data breaches, uh, which represents between them about 7.2 billion breached records. That's roughly the population of the planet, if not uh, just over. What that effectively means is each of these records corresponds to a certain individual. Needless to say, some of us are more breached than the others. But what this really means is, at an abstract level, everyone has been breached already. Each of these records uh, contains some level of personal information, if not plenty. But what does it actually mean? When you collect that kind of data and that number of breaches, what does it actually tell you? And that was the goal. We started looking at how big a role does human error play in data breaches? How big a role does insider threat play in these, in these breaches? So if you look on the, on the visuals, 2012 is on the left, and 2016 is, is on the right. On top, you see all the data breaches that have happened, uh, but irrespective of the filter on human uh, error. As you can see, in 2012, there were a lot of breaches. Uh, most of the Western countries, the US, they had been breached in their respective capacity. And as it evolved, the rest of the world got breached as well. But when you look down in blue, you notice how many of them were human error based or how many of them were as a result of things people did that could have been avoided. And surely in 2012, the total number of data breaches represented a very visible subset of all the incidents that have happened. So they were not all the countries, some of them had incidents. As you move into 2014, 
you definitely notice that more and more of the countries that are getting breached are having incidents because of human error. But the true awesomeness of, of the discovery that we, we claimed was that in 2016, you notice that it's indistinguishable to find a country that has not had breaches due to human error, not just other things. So the whole paradigm that five years ago, a super security professional, a forensic analyst, a criminal psychologist would have told you was, you know what, you can brute force your way, you can hack the machine, or if you're watching a Hollywood movie, you can hack the mainframe, whatever that means. Um, that, that's gone. You don't have to hack anything anymore. You just have to go after the people. And it's incredibly simple. And I'll give you a few examples. So we started looking at the data to say, how can we understand behavior within this context? If you go to Starbucks, um, often you're working on your computer, you're working on work stuff. You've never really noticed about who are the people who are sitting around you, behind you, over you. Have you also stopped to wonder that there is a security camera up on top in Starbucks for your safety and security only, obviously, but there is a person behind that security camera. And how close that security camera is uh, allows them to a great degree to understand and see whatever password you're about to type. So we did this experiment between me and my co-founder. My co-founder sat about three tables down and I sat on my table in the cafe and I started typing my password. So it was a side view, you know, you type the password like you do. And he took his phone out casually like he would and he put it on the side like this and he just recorded the whole thing. But it was a side view, he was not next to me, he was not around me, he was not sitting with me. And purely from the side, he was able to guess almost entirely what the password was because he could replay, he could slow it down, he could play it again in certain areas. And that's all it took for him to say, you know what, if you've ever been in Starbucks and if I've been around you, I essentially have a recording of you typing your password no matter the system. Now let me give you another example. You use your phones from time to time. Well, more than from time to time. You go to the tube, you unlock the phone. We don't think about it as much, but you actually do not need the password. Your phone, by default in most cases, is already logged in to every service you ever consume. You don't have to re-enter those passwords, right? Which means to get access to your information, all I need in most cases is the four digit pin that you enter about a hundred times a day. So when you enter that pin in the tube uh, in the rush hour or not in the rush hour, how, how much effort do you think it takes for someone else to notice what that looks like? The beauty of a four digit pin is even from a distance you can kind of figure out where the hand is going, what the numbers are, because we are pretty intuitive like that. Once I have access to data in your phone, I have access to everything. And that's it, you know, it really doesn't take much. So why would I go around hacking the mainframe if I could just get the data from the people who have it? We created a video that shows just how scary this is. And I'll play it to you. This is the evolution of all these breaches from 2007 all the way to 2016 and how that actually plays out. So if you look at how it starts, you know, 2005, the U.S. starts getting breached a little bit. Each of the dots that are glimmering represents a new data breach of a new category, which is represented down there. But if you just focus on, on the breaches as and when they happen, as you go into 2008 and 9, more and more you start seeing Western Europe uh, starting to get breached. But the U.S. is actually becoming a hotbed. And if you notice, there are some areas that are starting to shine a lot more than the others because they are getting breached a lot more. As this evolves, you notice that we enter into 2012, we are still mostly Western Europe and US, but then suddenly the rest of the world catches on and you have more and more breaches being reported in parts of the world which are, which are getting digitized as more and more IT systems get digital. And as we reach 2016, it's safe to say that if you're a digitally connected country, most of you have been breached. Now let's look at US exclusively. When you look at the same data in US, what you notice is, starting again from 2005, what has been the evolution? You see some clusters forming near the Silicon Valley or near California. You see some clusters forming near the East Coast, near New York and Boston, because that's where the financial hubs are and that's where the data hubs are. And they have consistently been the center of attacks. As it evolves, you very clearly notice very fast that you lose control. 
the breach has become a part of normal day. There's just nowhere we have not seen a breach happen. But there are these clusters that have formed over the course. About 5 billion records have been breached purely from US-based companies alone. But then you think, maybe Europe is safer, right? That used to be the assumption. It does not start with UK. It starts from outside UK. Some of the most major breaches reported in the early years were not coming from UK in terms of data. But UK catches on pretty fast. I mean, it, UK has a thing about catching up. And when it catches up, it actually exceeds it. So very fast and very soon, UK becomes the most breached country in the Europe uh, area. To the extent that actually if you start a company in UK, the likelihood of you getting breached is about twice as much as if you start in Spain. That, that's pretty sad when you think about it. And then obviously as we get into 2013, 14, 15 and 16, pretty much the rest of the world entirely uh, follows on. It's almost impossible to find a country that is digital enough that has not had a major data breach. And that's really important to understand because we ask the question, why? Why is that happening? Why is that scaling up so fast? And we mapped it out on a spectrum. We call that the spectrum of human threats to an organization. And what does it actually mean? We often talk a lot about uh, NSA, we talk about CIA, we talk about the rogue, we talk about the Edward Snowdens of the world. And those are all sitting in the malicious and the unhappy part of the spectrum. But as you come back down, most of the incidents do not happy, happen because someone is malicious. It, most of the incidents do not happen because you're selling your data on the dark web. Most people do not know what is the dark web. The dark web is the internet, by the way. There's really nothing special about it. Uh, but uh, when we go back down, you see accidental and innocent. Most people make mistakes innocently, which is, OK, maybe I sent the wrong email, my device got stolen. But more often than not, it's actually completely accidental. So I, send the, I printed the document that I forgot in the office, or I lost my storage device, a USB or I have a weak password, and so on and so forth. This is the spectrum where there is high frequency of incidents. Most of the major breaches start here. If we start acknowledging this aspect of behavior, that we cannot fix mistakes people do, we cannot, uh, we cannot avoid mistakes people do, but if we acknowledge them, we can start to actually build systems that address this part of the spectrum more than they address a state level, full blown military cyber invasion, which really does not happen on the average day. That is not going to happen to most people, at least in the near future. Comes the question, we still don't know what's going on. Because what is going on? I'm not putting the picture of Donald Trump here to make a statement. I'm putting there for everyone to understand that when half the population of one of the largest countries in the world votes for someone that every data analytics solution out there said wouldn't happen. That means it's a fail on, on, on the part of every data analyst in the world, every AI solution in the world, who couldn't predict not an edge case, but an overwhelming population who believed in something. So for me, this is a fail on part of people to understand data. At the same time, if you think of the NSA, most of us think of Edward Snowden. What we do not know about is a person called Harold Martin. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that name, but if you're not, go back, Google that name. Harold Martin was a contractor also at the NSA who has recently been indicted as of February. He stole, stole is a strong term, he took about 50 terabytes of information from, from the National Security Agency, roughly 850 times more information than what Edward Snowden took. And you know what did he say in court? He did not leak that information yet, but his official statement in court was that I'm just a compulsive hoarder. I store this information in my basement because it makes me feel good. That was the official statement that, that he made to the press. He has now been sentenced to, I think, multiple life uh, imprisonments uh, for stealing what is arguably the biggest collection of sensitive information ever stolen from any government agency. And that goes way above and beyond what Edward Snowden or WikiLeaks or any of them have taken in the recent history. Most of it is not known. But when you think about that, and when you think about the fact that things like that can happen, and it's not always bad people, it's not always malicious people, sometimes it might just be someone with a problem. That brings to the extent uh, the need to understand human behavior. But how do you actually go about understanding it in the first place? The way we do it is what we call cross-discipline innovation. 
Now that's not just a buzzword we've come up with. The way we actually address that is by combining a few different uh, areas of science that have existed for a long time. Digital fingerprinting is a concept that has existed for an incredibly long time on the internet, which is the idea of identifying unique things about individuals, data points, way of doing things, uh, activity, adding to that artificial intelligence to say we can learn and create base models of groups, so to say. So what is it that a group of salespeople typically look like on an average day? Do they usually go and jump around between different locations? Do they usually access a certain volume of file? Is it usual for them to snoop around and so on and so forth? But the secret sauce is to add to that human psychology. The study of human psychology goes far beyond the study of technology. There is science behind predicting behavior in terms of what happens when and if. And when you combine all of that, we become predictably unique. We are unique, but we are unique within paradigm. We are unique within uh, parameters that can be defined. So if you are an engineer compared to if you are a, a, a marketing person, there are some assumptions that we can make that you will have to fulfill in order to fulfill your job. And those assumptions make you predictable, but you're still unique. So once you understand the predictability, you can actually start understanding employee behavior. Most people focus on what is abnormal, the odd incident, the, the breach. What we started doing is we said we will start focusing on the normal uh, behavior. In that context, let me show you a case study. This is a case study we did with an enterprise company where within a matter of, I think, three months from August to October, we consumed their data and gave them some insights that they could not have got otherwise. So let me introduce to you David. David is a smart but regular employee in the company. On 27th of June 2016, we made a breach alert, as I like to call it. From 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., we found that there was unusual activity on David's account. And I, I will show you why that activity is unusual, and you will understand the approach we are taking when it comes to understanding human behavior. So the thing about human behavior is it's not single dimension. It's not uh, measurable by a number. The thing about human behavior is it works the way our brain works. We take input from the ears, we take input from the eyes, we take input from the, the touch, each of them being very sophisticated technologies by themselves. And then the brain combines them to say, let me figure out what's going on. Just because I don't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Sometimes I can touch it. Just because I can touch something doesn't mean it exists. Maybe I'm being fooled. So we combine things in a very clever way, in a non-linear way, if I might. So we have, in a similar manner, in the company, several modules. Each of these modules look at a different aspect of physical and non-physical behavior. Right now, we're looking at the more statistical aspects of, of behavior. So fast travel is a very common thing that is measured across most technology solutions today. If you've ever got an email from Google or Facebook saying suspicious sign-on detected because you signed in using a new device or you just changed countries, or your credit card company called you saying we've blocked your card because it's popped up in the gold store in Dubai. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fast travel. But what we said is we, let's take it one step further. So we created adaptive fast travel within companies to be able to say if we see activity for you in a certain location, then that neighborhood as a whole is a known neighborhood for you. So it might be West Coast all up. It might be all of UK. It might be near London. So in this particular case, on 27th of June for David, in blue you see the events we saw that we consider normal. Physically impossible for David to have done that in one day, but normal because we have seen similar things in the past. What you see in red is a series of events that we do not consider normal because we have no history of such a jump happening alongside the fact that physically it's impossible for this particular jump to have happened while taking into account things like VPNs, servers, and all of that, who do create this noise, eliminating that and saying this could not have happened. So there's a red flag for us, but that's not enough. We look at another module. In this particular case, this module looks at the activity profile through the different hours of the day. What does the average day for David look like? So when we look at that from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock, it's actually normal for David to have high activity. So that particular module is saying, look, there is high activity, but it's not abnormal. It actually happens. So this particular module is actually not saying something is bad. Instead, it's saying this is all right. Then you look at something a bit more complicated. 
we look at when something does happen at a given time of the day, how many things happen at once? So do you do 10 things, do you do 20 things? What does the session look like? And there we notice that in red is that particular day and in blue are all the days that we have on record before that the spikes between 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock are unusually high. To do that many things at that hour at once has not happened before. The probability of that is incredibly low. So what we are saying is that that hour for you to be that efficient is probably not the case. When you combine these three, you get probability of what's going on and how things are, are happening. And when you graph it, you see some things are saying it's bad, some things are saying it's not bad. Overall, the combination of these three at a particular time segment, we are saying, tells us that something bad has happened. That's not enough. We have above 30 different modules that are looking at different aspects, just like the three you saw, to combine these different things. These span from past behavior to things like peer group analysis, that if you are suspiciously high on volume, like what happened in Panama paper leaks, uh, your peers might not be. So compared to your peers, you are suspiciously above or below, so that is unusual. Or looking at location profile, or looking at novelty. Do you usually access 1,000 new files on any given day? Do you usually send 2,000 emails on any given day? They're all signals, but by themselves, they are misleading. When you combine them with different aspects, like influence, like collaboration, you get this snapshot of which you can slice out and say something is good or bad. That's actually how the brain operates. That's actually how criminal psychologists would operate and uh, the police operates. This actually got us some good uh, references. Uh, the CEO of Hiscox recently said that not only does it help us protect us from cyber attacks, but also helps organizations get an insight into the behavior of the people that generate the most uh, success. So it could be high revenue generators, it could be the best performing people, it could be influencers, and it could be people who are just doing well. If you can understand what makes good people good, you can finally train the rest. And that's been the golden nugget all along. That's why I say we are predictably unique, incredibly so. And in that uniqueness, what we have done is we started by understanding normal. We said, let's understand normal behavior. Let's not try after and going after abnormal behavior. Abnormal behavior should be abnormal. And adding to that, identifying productivity and performance pattern, because they are usually precursors to workplace behavior to say there might be a breach, uh, there might have been a leak, you might have been compromised, you might have a virus on your system that's communicating with the rest of the organization, not you. And then finally mapping out the threat to say, you know what? There is a threat, there is a breach, there is an incident, uh, and this is what it is. Let me give you context. When you actually do that, uh, when you understand the behavior pattern, uh, when you understand sensitive information, and when you then handle the risk and threat, you start understanding behavior at a level that you couldn't have understood before. You understand what baseline behavior looks like. What is it that my top salespeople are doing better than the people who are not performing well? Is it that they're a bit more spread out? Is it that they do not work 10 hours a day, they work only five hours a day, and it's okay because they're doing a better job? Can I train that? Is it that when I don't trust that employee who claims to work from home, I have data that tells me that generally speaking, my company is doing well when they work from home, so I should stop being a micromanager. Th those kind of data points can now be exposed. Is it that every time I do the performance review and I judge the people who don't talk much as being low performers uh, wrong? How do you actually finally remove that performance bias in the workplace, which usually is that the, the more you talk, the more active you are, the louder you are, the better you're doing? Well, now we've got data to show you might not be the best person for the job because you know what? Someone else who's not talking as much might be better. So that's essentially what we do. Um, I just realized I do have a slide that would be a bit misleading because no, we do not have a stand. This is from last week, but the top statement applies that the thing we genuinely believe in at the company that we have created is you have to understand people before you understand data. Understanding data is a function of, of understanding people, but if you don't understand why people do things they do, uh, we'll continue to have breaches. And AI is a tool to do that, and we've shown a methodology there's a lot of other ways to do that. At this point, I will stop, and we'll take a few questions and uh, go from there. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, 
the main way in uh, machine learning in artificial intelligence it's looking for pattern yes absolutely but the problem from my experience i see and understand very well how those criminals are trying to avoiding being behave in pattern so how to deal with that so this is something we have talked about at length because you're right we, we were asked this question uh, a while ago that what happens if you have a spy in the organization who joined as a, a spy so the pattern was never there unusual pattern so to say the, the power of this lies in the concept that we have which is that while your pattern might not exist compared to a peers you're still unusual so the core thing about a suspicious uh, em employee or a criminal, let's say, uh, at the heart of it, a criminal will do a crime that makes them a criminal. When that crime happens, around that time when the crime happens, everyone else will be normal. So if I am just uh, doing 20% more every day, so in, in case of Panama Papers, the person who stole the information stole it over a course of 10 years. Every day stole a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. We could never detect that just by looking at that person. But we could if you look at the rest of the company because no one else has done that. Uh, no one else in a period of one month, not just one day, has downloaded 500 files. In a period of one year, downloaded 1,000 files. So the beauty is not just to look at a pattern in a fixed time, but to look at pattern in different dimensions, in multiple time, and also look at peers. That tends to take away the bias that usually patterns have. Um, there still might be things we don't know, but we will, we'd love to add modules for that. When, when I was uh, attracted to come to this lecture uh, about psychologies and data, I was thinking, I was thinking that uh, in order to create the patterns that machine learning need, you would uh, perhaps, uh, because I, w I didn't know that you're going to use this spy example, so I, I was, uh, because I'm trying to put psychology into something I'm creating. So I was thinking uh, more like uh, you will use uh, psychological theory about different uh, personality, different type of behavior to associate it with um, probability and statistic of things happening. And I was thinking of big data more like that. And, uh, and with this bias example, I suppose you could uh, also um, use a bit of history about the kind of personality as well as the behavior patterns to sort of link it together that this could be inspired and th that kind of thing because of these uh, patterns of behavior. You're actually 100% right. Uh, we, that's a part that's very difficult to talk about in terms of uh, data. But what we've done is we've created a framework on top of which, if you imagine the classic theory around people who are introverted or extroverted in psychology, what we are saying is, instead of taking how you measure that, we use our data to measure it. So we can have a module in theory that can measure whether you're more introverted or extroverted based on the communication. But then apply the theories from psychology to say, how do people move from being shy to not shy? Is that something that can happen overnight? But we know from studies how it happens and how it can happen. Therefore, when we see something different, it's an anomaly. So you're actually correct in saying that it is possible to use data and build personality profiles to actually combine them in a way that you use the probability theory to say, if, uh, if you do A and B, then the most likely thing you're going to do next is C. Uh, that's at a theoretical level yeah, still because possible. I was thinking things like uh, psychosomatic and other t personality theories like Myers, and where you've got like different, you know. So th the more sophisticated, you, that's why you understand the person and the people. Yeah. and then the data and so you have to like uh, kind of plan a bit pre-plan and then you from there there's a the patterns and so you ask the data to look for these patterns you and you know the interesting thing here is uh, one of the assumptions and one of the claims we've made from day one is surveys don't work all the current tests in psychology and HR have been centered around asking for input from people for them to fill out. So depending on the mood on the day, it actually varies quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. But if you take Meyer Briggs and if you say that I take those 14 classes, uh, 16 classes, and if you know the people who belong to those classes and use the data we have and cluster them, 
what you've created is a data signature for each of those classes. And then going forward, without anyone ever answering a question, you already can figure out which class they belong to. Yeah, because I was thinking there's so many uh, psychology theories of different type of things. I, I was thinking that the design somewhere where at the front you will try to assess the person of what's the likelihood of belonging to this class of psychology patterns that you can have. And then you try to walk through that pathway to see whether it fit. If not, try another one and that kind of thing. Yeah, I was thinking of designing possible. like that, you know. Um, I'll let you choose. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, obviously, you're building this through the digital interactions, but physical interactions and personal interactions throughout the company are very obviously very important to yep. getting the job done. So do you foresee in the future you might be able to um, use other techniques um, to take that into account? And then how would you see the privacy implications, let's say, monitoring throughout the the business using you know the the example of cameras and stuff that you used initially this is the i mean there is an evolutionary question here on where is it headed to yeah. um, and for us it's very important to address privacy head on rather than waiting for it to happen yeah. and say oh we've created something that is creating more surveillance than empowerment uh, we have the ability to consume any information that is identifiable to the people in a semi anonymized way yeah. So it could be door access, for instance. Yeah. Yes, it can be consumed if there is a digital record of it. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the likes of CCTVs and stuff, at the minute, we do not intend to go into that yeah. space yeah. for the very reason that it's not just that the data is there. It's actually uh, ambiguous data. There's no good uh, context behind interactions, whereas digital data has very strong context. Mm -hmm. So what we are going after is what I call signal and strong indicators. So you don't need all the data. You need the right data. So if I know that you entered the building, and if I know you entered this door, I can infer a lot of things in between where you travel through. Mm -hmm. And that's why we don't go after everything. The likes of video, the likes of browsing history, laptops, the, those things mm -hmm. should never be captured, in my opinion. Yeah. There is a difference between personal data and company data. Of course, if you're accessing resources from the workplace, it should be. But if you're doing something on your own time, if you're sending a doctor's appointment on your private Gmail, it's no one's business, you know. So there is an ethical question in there, yeah. uh, and and we are very conscious of that. Great, thank you. Um, we'll take I think one or maybe two last questions uh, before we wrap up. Um, we can have that, and then we come here. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I'm just thinking, even so you're using digital data, I think there is still a very fine line between personal digital data, company digital yeah. data. Um, so I understand how useful this tool might be for the employer, but how um, should employee uh, behave in these circumstances? And uh, obviously you may have some false positives in there. Uh, so what kind of protection um, So there are will three there? things that we've done to make sure that this is uh, not just for the employer but for the employee. First thing is we actually architecturally built it in a way that you cannot consume private information. You don't consume content of information rather than private. So if let's say we know about who's communicating with whom, we don't know the content of the communication. Uh, the second thing is we've taken a lot of effort in making sure that we're not going into things that are inherently private, so digital private, so to say. So things like your own personal work uh, that you're not doing on company time, or even if you're doing it on the company laptop, that's related to your stuff. So no browsing, no network activity, none of that. And the third is the most important one, which is architecturally we've created the ability to open it both to the employer and to the employee. You should be able to log in and see your own profile and your own models that are being created. It should not be sitting behind a black box for someone else to analyze that you can't question. So when there is a false positive, you should be able to challenge that. And that's incredibly important. So rather than having a false acquisition, you actually have a more empowerment conversation. The future of that is actually very interesting because as it evolves, you should be able to see that this is what my average day looked like over the last week. Clearly, I didn't do as much as I wanted to, or I got stuck. You can have that empowerment conversation by yourself and then compare it to, let's say, the model profile in the company. 
not a particular person, but the average person. So over time, it becomes a training tool for the individual. And for the company, it becomes a tool that allows them to have data rather than just claims that I feel you're not doing well. Uh, so there are ways to address that. We have safeguards in place in the product itself to take care of most of them. But we will see how it evolves. It's eventually an evolution question. OK, thank you. Think I think we have time for just one more quick question. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned earlier the example with Donald Trump, like analysts predicting something, something else happened. Would you say that maybe even in the data that you have, there, there might be biases that, I don't know, in, in just in the way that we perceive those things, that might influence whether your, your predictions are correct or not, whether you can predict certain data breaches? I think all data fundamentally have bias. There is no data that doesn't have bias. And <coughs> that's because data is collected through a means and that medium might be biased. So if we collect data here, it's biased because it's a data conference. If you collect data from weather, it might be biased because the sun might be in a certain part of the solar system today or whatever that is. The bias will be there. The challenge is how do you create a model that over time can eliminate most of the bias? For us, we've approached it in a way that we don't try to build the framework or the base AI infrastructure, how the machine learning works, with a problem in mind. We try to create neutral signals, the location signal, the collaboration, the time of the day, the average profile. Each of them don't have a purpose yet. And then when you combine them, you create a purpose. So you can combine them in a variety of different ways. If it turns out to be false, you rehash them. So that's partly what eliminates most of the bias in the system, because we don't have one fixed way of actually using this information. That said, over time, there will be bias that we will identify and we'll eliminate. So the predictions are not meant to be 100% accurate. That would be, well, magic. And I don't think we know how to do that yet. Thank you. At this point, I think we will wrap up. Uh, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed that. I'm around, I mean, obviously. If not, you can always reach us at statustoday.com or write to me. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much.